we are recording. Oh, I think I have to request permission from you, Aaron. Did I've it... actually hit the record button already. You're good. Okay, great. We've started recording. Um, let me ask questions for really quick. Okay, so this is Willamette Week's endorsement interview for Senate District 14. Um, we are joined by Kate Lieber and Harmony Mulkey. Did I pronounce that correctly? Is it yes. Mulkey? Okay, yep. great. I haven't, I haven't met you before, so I didn't know. Um, so why don't we get started with um, just a basic bio intro of who you are, um, why you're running for this race, that sort of thing. Keep it at about two minutes. Um, Harmony, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so um, this is my very first jump into politics. I have a background in mental health where I worked as a case manager with the foster care system um, at a nonprofit down in Salem for about three years before um, I had my second child and the job didn't pay enough to keep me on. And so I loved the population I was working with and we decided at that time to bring home the kids we were working with. <laughs> so we started doing foster care and we did that for about three years as well. And um, during that time, I just fell in love with those boys that we were working with, mostly through OIA, Oregon Youth Authority. Um, and uh, really that kind of lit a fire under me for what's going on in our foster care system. Um, I also serve on the board of a nonprofit uh, down in the Salem area for foster care and mental health. And um, what really kind of lit the fire for me politically, besides you know having a heart for those kids and, and seeing kind of the, the inner workings of the system was uh, HB 3063 last year was huge. So that was the vaccine bill that was going through the legislature. And before then I'd been pretty passive with politics. I mean, always interested in it from a cultural perspective, but not really involved in the local level at all. Um, and that kind of changed everything because it would have been the first time that my, um, well, my kids' education was being threatened. They would not have been able to receive an education at our private school or a public school in Oregon. So that um, got me started in my political journey. And from there, I met a lot of amazing men and women who um, were also passionate about you know, their topics of choice and um, kind of got hooked up with um, running for state senate. So it was sort of a last minute decision because there was no Republican running in our district. Um, and I thought, gosh, we cannot, we can't let that happen. We have to at least have a good run at it. And um, I think I filed uh, with about three days left before the filing deadline, I decided to file. And then um, the lockdowns went into place about a week later. So it's been a wild ride, but that's sort of uh, my journey to here. So I am married. I have three little boys, age five, eight, and nine, and they are why I'm running. So. Thanks so much. And I just want to clarify something. So on the voters pamphlet website, it says that you're a Republican, but also kind of libertarian. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could explain sort of where you fall on that spectrum a little bit. Yeah, so I align, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Republican through and through. Oh, we got another person. Yeah, I think it's our co my colleague, Rachel Monahan. Oh, great. Yeah. So, um, and then I also won the cross nomination for the Libertarian Party. So um, they, we reached out and, you know, did a, basically they're endorsing me and nominating me for their, to be their candidate as well. And I align um, with the Libertarian Party in the sense that I am all for smaller government and less regulation and less red tape um, and kind of streamlining a lot of the bureaucracy that's going on down in Salem. Awesome. And Kate, same to you, a brief intro about who you are and why you're running, please. You bet. Thanks so much. Uh, so I grew up in Indiana. I was raised by a single mom after uh, my dad died when I was 10. And I, I think one of the the foundational things that um, you should know about me is that I grew up gay in Indiana in the 80s. And, and that was, you know, really, I knew what it was really like to feel powerless and unseen um, because I never really wanted to feel that way again. And because I, quite frankly, I didn't want anybody else to feel that way. It really motivated, motivated me to go to law school, uh, which I did. It's actually where I met my wife. We've been together for 27 years. Moved to Oregon in 1995, and I became a deputy district attorney. 
Um, I concentrated really mostly on fighting for the rights of children. Uh, I, I prosecuted child abuse cases, domestic violence cases, and juvenile. Uh, after leaving the district attorney's office, I received what I consider to be one of my battle scars, which is I was diagnosed with uh, stage three breast cancer. I was 42. Um, my kids were young. I've got two children. They're now 16 and 18, but then they were young. And, you know, I really, I saw our broken healthcare system up close and personal. And, and I, I carry that really with me because, you know, no one really should be fighting to pay the bills while you're literally fighting for your life. Uh, you know, while I was battling breast cancer, um, I got a call from the governor's office and they asked if I wanted to join uh, the Psychiatric Security Review Board. That's the review board that has jurisdiction over people in the state uh, under a guilty except for insanity designation. And, you know, I chaired that board for five years out of the eight years I was on it. Um, it really gave me an understanding of state government, how it works, but also a look into our broken mental health system. And it sounds like Harmony, I have some similarities in, in really wanting to fight for the mental health um, of all Oregonians. And quite frankly, just as an aside through COVID uh, and with the wildfires, I am really concerned about the mental health of our citizens right now. Um, I was really after that, I rolled off that board and I was really interested in the intersection of mental health and homelessness. You know, homelessness is really kind of one of our biggest humanitarian issues of our age. And so currently I, uh, I joined the transition, transition Projects, which transitions a thousand people a year out of homelessness into homes. Uh, and I currently chair that board. Um, and it's really something that uh, we're gonna have to really pay attention to, especially as the moratorium comes to an end on, our, um, on rent moratoriums. But fundamentally, I'm a teacher at heart. I've been a teacher at Portland Community College in the criminal justice uh, department, I think since I first started teaching there in 1998. So I've taught for many, many, many years. And those students, a lot of them is the first time they've ever gone to school, the first are their first generation college students. So I take that very seriously. But the question I think is, how did I get here? Well, I, Harmony and I share that we're, you know, I, I, we're first time politicians. I consider myself to be actually an accidental politician because this was not the path I saw myself going down. But I was really first um, sort of drawn into it by the 2016 election. Uh, look, Donald Trump being in the White House really have, have threatened so many things. And his promoting of bigotry and hatred while he is rolling back virtually every single right we hold dear, I, I made me really realize that our state government has to be strong and it has to be ready. Um, and, and, and it has to be prepared for making hard decisions and really fighting against um, the divisions that are coming out of Washington, DC. But you know, even when that was happening, I thought we were okay in Oregon. Um, I'm a Democrat, I'm a lifelong Democrat. I, we had a Democrat in the governor's office. We had a supermajority in the legislature. And then I really took notice when the Republicans walked out in 2019. That's when I was, I really realized we might be more broken than I thought. So look, all of my career, I have fought to equalize the imbalance of power. My core motivation is somebody who gets things done. I tend to chair almost every board I've ever been on. I'm a tremendously driven person. And you know, with the pandemic and the wildfires that have consumed us all, um, the stakes are even higher. And really it's about who's gonna sit at the table and make really hard decisions. So I'm ready to do that. That's why I believe I'm the right candidate and that's why I'm here today. So we'll start with you, Kate, for the next question since you're sure. um, already talking. Um, if you are elected to the legislature, what will your priorities be or what's the first bill that you wanna get passed? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, my priorities since, the, since really COVID haven't changed that much. Um, I have always been, um, passionate about making sure that we have, everyone has access to healthcare, making sure that we have a robust education system for our children, um, and really making sure that we house the most vulnerable in our community. COVID, however, has created, of course, as we all know, these incredible budget deficits and these incredible, um, um, just 
unbelievable ways that we are going to have to prop up our economy. So one of the first things that we're going to really need to do is, is figure out how do we help small businesses? How do we make sure that we get our economy moving again? How do we open up responsibly and not recklessly? Um, and how do we make sure that we continue to protect the people that are most vulnerable in the state? Uh, one of the first bills that I am hoping to introduce um, is a bill to really make it easier for those that are homeless with criminal histories to actually get housing. Because if we continue to create barriers for the homeless to get housing, we're gonna to continue to have the problems that we see on our streets today. Thanks, um, same to you, Harmony. What would your um, priorities be in the legislature? What's the first bill that you would wanna introduce? Yeah, so um, you know, being a Republican and a Libertarian candidate, I really have, um, I'm really gonna try to not put very much legislation forth. Like it's, I think we have way too many bills, way too much red tape um, going on down in Salem. And you know, my, my priority is gonna be to streamline a lot of the bills that we, we already have in place. And so um, that being said, I do have issues that are very important to me, such as medical freedom. Um, that is something that's uh, huge on my radar. And I think we all know with COVID, there is probably coming legislation uh, with vaccines. So it'll be on the top of my list to maintain medical freedom and freedom of choice and bodily autonomy for um, everyone in Oregon, um, which I think is really important. Also foster care reform. I think, um, you know, if, it, if it's a choice, like Kate said, there are huge budget shortfalls. And if it's a choice between raising taxes or cutting programs, I'm gonna be a proponent for cutting programs. And that includes not programs that help, but the kind of the bureaucracy, the um, task forces, the commissions, the councils that have previously been appointed that are really ineffective and sucking money um, and really streamline those programs so that we can get um, boots on the ground help for the foster care industry. Um, and then thirdly, uh, I'm a big proponent for school choice. And I think right now with COVID, um, parents are waking up to the reality that they're not happy with the public schools. They're not happy with the way things are going. They're not happy with the curriculum and their children are not receiving the education and the services that they need at this time. Um, and, and honestly, it's not just a COVID issue. The schools have been struggling for a while. So I am a proponent of school choice. And um, you know, that can look like a lot of different things. I think um, you know, from voucher system to education savings accounts and um, more charters, schools, privatizing certain aspects of the, the school system. But I think um, the one that stands out to me would be the education savings account and really working on a bill that would focus on getting tax dollars into the hands of parents who know their children and know their students and know exactly what they need um, because education isn't a one size fits all. So can I, can I ask um, a little more about your involvement and in what you're calling medical freedom? It's, it's that a way you got into politics. I know there were a lot of women who uh, were involved in, in past le legislative sessions um, yeah. having against that. Is that how you got involved in? It is, yeah. The, the, the organization Oregonians for Medical Freedom um, mm -hmm. is a big supporter. I'm a big supporter of them. Um, and that is um, really what lit a fire underneath me um, was that threat of having my children's right to an education being removed um, here in Oregon. And so... So, so you don't have, your children aren't vaccinated or aren't no, my children are partially vaccinated, all of them. We don't follow the CDC schedule. Um, and, uh, you know, that's under doctor's recommendations. And we work with our doctor. And I would fight for the right for every Oregonian to make decisions for their own bodies and their own children, you know, with their doctors on those issues. And so what vaccines do you consider unsafe at this point? Well, at this point, um, we've stopped doing any vaccinations at all with our kids. They all, we started on a slow schedule and then we've moved to not doing any at this point. So I don't yeah. have a, a full list in front of me. Um, I, I think, all, is, oh, sorry. sorry. No, I think all vaccinations carry uh, some risk, some level of risk. 
because it's a, a pharmaceutical product and even Tylenol, you know, kills people sometimes. So there's, there's a certain level of risk that everyone needs to be able to weigh and where there's a risk, there has to be a choice. And, um, you know, I think parents have the ability to think logically about these things. And um, like, for example, uh, my oldest son has asthma and the slow schedule recommendation was for him not to receive the pertussis vaccination when I was around the age of two. Um, and we went ahead and went against that, the recommendation on the slower schedule. And he said, we would actually prefer to him to have that pertussis vaccination because of his asthma. Um, whereas, you know, his brother, on the other hand, if, if they got pertussis, I wouldn't be worried. You know, I, I'm pretty sure they'd be able to handle it. So it's a case by case basis. Again, not a one size fits all. And I advocate for every parent being able to make those decisions with their doctor. And um, what was I going to say? Oh, so how, how do you imagine? I mean, I think a lot of people in this country are waiting for a vaccine for mm -hmm. COVID. Um, and that the, the kind of pandemic life that we've been living will only end in this country because when we have a vaccination. How do, how do you imagine that the pandemic will end in this country? Yeah, you know, I, I really despise that line of thinking. I think it's driven by the pharma pharmaceutical companies who stand to make billions off of the production of the vaccination. Um, I think or there's always been families and individuals in the United States, I mean, for hundreds of years who have decided to opt out of vaccinations, who have decided they want to live a, a clean lifestyle, or, you know, maybe they're a crunchy granola mom and they've decided they want to stay away from all toxins. Like there are people on everywhere in, in the United States that choose alternative lifestyles. And I will advocate for each and every one of those family members to have that option. So as far as COVID goes, I know, I know, I mean, hundreds of people who will never take a vaccination. They've either had a child who has been injured by vaccines previously. They don't trust this um, brand new type of vaccination. I know it's like a DNA, new DNA vaccinations that are coming through untested, unproven, rushed through, you know, and a lot of people who, um, are skeptical of President Trump also do not want to take a vaccination that he's pushing through at warp speed, you know. So um, I think there are people on all sides of the aisle who are skeptical and, and cautious about vaccine uptake. Absolutely, there are definitely uh, people on both sides of the aisle on that. Are you voting for Trump? For I am. Yeah, I voted for Trump in 2016, kind of. Um, just waiting to see what would happen, not really sure what we would get. And this time around, I'm voting enthusiastically for Trump. I, I really um, stand behind the policies that he has put forth. And um, yeah, I'm advocating for him 100%. I actually, I realize you didn't quite answer my question of how do you yeah, envision Yeah, reframe it again. <laughs> oh, opening for COVID. Yeah. You know, I, I really don't know. I think we're going to have to sit back and watch how this goes because there, I will, I stand for freedom. I know there's, there are people who would just will not take a vaccine and um, it's scary. It's scary times entering into, you know, how is this going to look? What kind of coercion is going to be used? And we've already seen, um, like I mentioned my own personal story last year at the state level in Oregon, using those coercive tactics saying, um, and I heard, they. I was told the language, well, we're not denying your children an education. They just can't go to a public or a private school without their vaccinations. Um, and that's coercion. That is, um, it's a disgusting tactic. And I believe we will see that being used with the COVID vaccine as well. Well, you don't have to take a vaccine. We would never mandate a vaccine, but you can't travel. You can't enter a public space you can't um, be an educator. So these types of things I've seen already talked about and um, I am very... Um, okay, but I get, I, get, I get you don't want anyone to have to take the vaccine. What mm -hmm. is, what's the alternative, like, you know? Oh, the oh, 600,000 American dead, like three Yeah, I think the alternative... How many, how many dead people if we're not gonna take the vaccine? I think the alternative is to take the approach that Sweden has taken, um, which is opening up and building natural herd immunity. 
and herd immunity um, means a lot more dead people. Sweden has moved away from herd immunity. So we have to open up. I mean, people, people die every, we are all going to die. And I think we need to take, Definitely. <laughs> we're all going to die. Not COVID, I'll tell you that. Uh, we need to take a, a huge um, a shift from focusing on locking down healthy people, shutting down businesses, no more schools, no more gatherings, um, really the destruction of society as we know it and move towards protecting the ones who are really vulnerable, which are those in you know, uh, convalescent care facilities, memory care facilities, our elderly population. And I think we need to be focusing a lot more on this group of people and getting them the support they need while safely reopening um, everyone else. Um, thank you for the mm -hmm. answers. Um, Tess, you can get us back on track. Sorry to no my um, personal interest here. And I'd love to answer some of the same questions if that's okay. Do you want, I haven't, I don't think I've heard your response to these questions before. So if you want to kind of respond to what your opponent was saying, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So here, here's the thing, you know, let me, let me just take the childhood vaccines first, right? All 50 states have vaccine mandates. Um, and like all 50 states, we have a medical exception that Oregon is no different. There is nobody that said we were going to get rid of the medical exception, right? So that's that's one thing. So we we that that I think is a specious argument, really, about really this coercion. And quite frankly, we know that individual decisions um, can impact the safety of entire communities, especially when we're talking about childhood vaccines. Right, we know that we've eradicated measles and we've eradicated other things that have come back and without getting all those vaccines, it's really, really important um, to understand that we're gonna have medically fragile children who will die from diseases we can prevent. So again, we're, it, we're, not, we're, we're not taking away a medical exemption to the vaccines. Oh, I- but Let's now take, let me now take- Religious and philosophical exemptions as well. I, there are non-medical exemptions currently in Oregon, which we still have, right? So Absolutely. I'm not going to get into a philosophical debate with you regarding vaccines or whether or not they protect, they protect children. You might, I, personal choice versus protecting vulnerable children is really the kind of thing that we're talking about here. But let me talk about the, let me talk about COVID, right? We're in a world of hurt. We all know that. COVID has taken away people's livelihoods. It has taken away people's lives. It, is, it has children at home, right? And we have to understand that that is a huge hardship, but we're not gonna get out of this by simply creating a herd immunity. I want to open up, but we have to open up responsibly, not recklessly. And that's why we have to follow science. Science is based on data. Science is based on facts. We know that you wear a mask, it will protect you and those around you. We know that when you practice social, practice social distancing, that that will help. But sacrificing hundreds of thousands of people simply because we want to have our own personal choice is where I draw the line. And so I'm all about science. I, what I'm not about I'm not about taking somebody's opinion, which is what President Trump puts out all the time, not based on science, not based on data, not based on facts, and puts people's lives at risk on a daily basis. So I'm ready to open us up, but I'm ready to do it responsibly and not recklessly. I'm gonna switch gears here if that's all right with everybody. Um, moving on towards the criminal justice direction. And Kate, we can start with you since you were just talking and we'll go to Harmony second. Um, in June, the legislature passed um, a series of police reform bills. Um, I wanna know what was your stance on those bills? Did you think that they didn't go far enough? Did they go too far? Um, in future sessions, how would you amend those bills if possible? Or what, what changes would you like to see? Yeah. So. We have work to do in the criminal justice system. And I think that we have to uh, understand the criminal justice system has many parts to it, right? So when we're talking about uh, police in particular, 
Um, I think that we have, uh, we definitely need to um, make sure that we have uh, rules so um, that police are acting appropriately. Look, I spent, I spent a lot of years in the criminal justice system, right? I mean, I have deep actual knowledge around, around sort of what's been happening in terms of police practices. And we do have systemic racism within that system. And that is something that is taken, we've had it for hundreds of years. We've also placed our police in a really, really precarious spot. We have defunded many of the social services, especially around mental health. We have pushed those people out onto the streets and we have told the police to go out and deal with it. And I think that puts the police in a really precarious spot and that's what's been happening. So I am all about making sure that we root out those police officers who should not be on the force I am all about making sure that we give really strong parameters for the police who are on the force. And I'm also about making sure that we appropriately support them and give them the training they need to deal with the extraordinarily complex issues that are facing them on the streets today. Look, police have got to be here. We're, we're not gonna defund the police, right? Should we do a top down and figure out if we're spending the money in the right way? Absolutely, I'm all for that. I wanna make sure that we don't waste any funds, but let's make sure that we're giving police the tools to really deal with what's happening on the streets. And what's happening on the streets is very complex right now. Now go to the other system. Can I just ask one follow-up on that? And I'll, um, Harmony, and then we'll go to you. Um, would you support an outright ban on tear gas? I know in the, in the last session, there was a loophole where police can use it in a riot, would you support it just being completely banned or do you like it the way it's designated currently? I, I don't think there should be an, I, I don't think that we should take away that tool from the police, but I do think that we should put limitations on it. Gotcha. And um, now we will go over to Harmony. Same question. What was your take on those, um, that series of bills that was passed? Um, and then if you could also answer that tear gas question too. Please. Yeah, so I actually uh, agree with Kate in a lot of this. Um, you know, I think that there is room for police reform. The officers that I've met um, while campaigning all almost 100% agree that there needs to be some kind of reform and they welcome reform. All of them want to be doing their jobs better and more efficiently. And if they have, um, you know, like mental health teams working with them, they are all for that. They would rather be focusing on, on other areas if at all possible. Um, it is a complex issue. It's, you know, we need to be supporting our police officers, giving them the tools and the training that they need so that they can be efficient. Um, defunding the police is not something that we can do. We, we've seen a, a rise in violence, uh, gun violence here in Portland, 250% this September versus last September. Um, you know, there is a lot of room for um, the police to have more training. And I think the officers that I've met with um, agree with that and welcome welcome that. And I would support uh, police reform in those areas. Um, defunding the police, however, is not an option. Um, and then tear gas. Um, yeah, I, I support the use of tear gas. I think it's the most humane, uh, humane tactic in a lot of situations. I think shooting rubber bullets at people um, can be really damaging and leave really lasting impacts. And also, um, you know, I'm new to the conversation, but uh, just thinking through having to designate it as a riot um, in order to use the, the tools they have on hand, I think gets really, sets really dangerous precedent. Um, and for people who are possibly arrested during that time, now they're facing riot charges. <laughs> you know, um, and I don't know if that gets bumped up. So, so I don't think um, having to designate it a riot is necessarily uh, beneficial or helpful. So you mean that now the fact that, because we've seen instances where police will say, oh, it's a riot, we have to use tear gas, whereas before in that same circumstance, they might not have necessarily described it as a riot. Is that, are you referring to that? Yeah, yeah ac that's accurate. And, yeah. you know, they might be designating something as a riot that doesn't need to be just so they can use the tools that they need to, I would imagine. And I don't know if Kate has some more insight into that. Great. Well, we, I know we're, this is only supposed to go till four. Do you, both of you have about 10 more minutes or do you have to get going? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. Um, I'll just try to keep it to one more question. I'm 
at Willamette, we, we value people who can, you know, think independently beyond just the party lines. So I'm wondering um, for each of you, if there's an issue where you feel like you really, you're, you're willing to diverge on from the party that you're representing. Um, so Harmony, let's start with you on that one. Yeah, well, I mean, um, you know, specifically HB 3063 was supported by a lot of Republican candidates. And um, that's, that's one area that I will stand strong in is the area of maintaining medical freedom for every citizen in Oregon. Um, and I wouldn't stand on party lines for that. That is something I'm very, I'm known for is being able to be a standalone on issues. So um, yeah, I mean, it would depend on the issue, of course, but I'm, yeah, I, I'm definitely willing to di diverge from my party. Okay. If, if needed. Mm -hmm. And Kate, same to you, any issues where you might diverge from your party? Yeah, you know, I don't, I, I, I can't like, uh, at this point, sort of play into a hypothetical in terms of like what I might be diverging from, but I, what my value proposition is, is that I am open-minded, I'm a learner, I listen to both sides. I think it is very important that we bring everybody to the table and I'm a lifelong Democrat. I mean, I've been a lifelong Democrat for, well, my whole life. And so it, it really is one of those things though that I think it's, this is all about who's gonna be sitting at the table when unbelievably difficult questions are gonna to have to be answered and how do we do that in a way that aligns with our values? So here's a here's the way to follow up on that. Um, you yeah. mentioned that you you know saw the need for there to be a you know you're in a democratic stronghold. You needed to you need Oregon government to be functioning if the federal government isn't in your view. So yeah. how would you rate how? Uh, Governor Brown has done in the face of the pandemic? Yeah, I, um, so again, I, I think, great. so I think history is going to judge her. Um, I think that she's going to be on the right side of history. I think in many ways she's done uh, really well with the pandemic with, uh, and remember the pandemic is this movable squishy thing, which you, we don't even, we haven't even seen the end of it. So I think it's hard to give her a rating based on her overall thing of the pandemic because we don't even know where it ends yet. But I would say she is doing very well in terms of following the science and the data. And the problem is, is that like getting at this pandemic is kind of like trying to hold on to sand, right? I mean, it's this ever shifting and ever changing. I think we know a lot more about it, but I, I, I have seen her be the leader that we need and have made really, hard decisions. I mean, she shut us down pretty early in this. Um, she's got good guidelines that if we follow them, I think that we would do much better than we're doing. I, I, I still go back to this whole thing is why we're not all wearing masks. I don't get it. I real, I just, I don't fundamentally understand why people can't understand that wearing a mask isn't for me, it's for you. And so, um, I, I'm, I'm going to say the history is going to judge her, but I believe that she's done a a pretty good job in a really difficult situation. Thank you. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I love how you keep saying at the table, and I think there is room at the table for different opinions. And right now in Salem, there is a super majority and we've been Democrat controlled for the last 30 years. So the Republicans really have no voice and that's why I'm here. I'm here to give a voice to conservative voters. I'm here to give a voice to moms. I'm here to give a voice to, um, you know, people who haven't had a voice in 30 years here in Oregon politics. So everything, there is room for a difference of opinion. And what we are seeing right now in Salem is not a difference of opinion. It's everybody falling in line behind one person, Kate Brown. She is leading. There has been no outcry from the Democrat party saying what's going on. Why are, are you not giving leadership back over to the legislature to do their job? She still is working under these emergency orders um, and it's not okay. It, it's, it goes against the law. It's not, it's not okay uh, to see this be happening. So I, the way she's handled this pandemic, I think is a huge overreach. She has overreached um, and has not given voice to the legislature, although the legislature is completely Democrat and would fall in line. So I think come, this coming November, we need to have more Republicans in office 
so that there is balance in that conversation. We have to be able to go back and forth. And we can't, we don't do that right now. The only, I mean, you, you brought up the walkouts, the only recourse that the Republicans had was to deny quorum and walk out. That was, that's all they had. They were not able to work with the Democrats. So I think it's important that we have to bring balance to the legislature and that's what I'm fighting for. I mean, isn't the counter argument that y'all are just bad losers? <laughs> no, I, you know, quorum is in place for a reason. I mean, Democrats quorum won. They won right out. Win an election. It's checks and balances. It's checks and balances. And there are it's checks important. and balances if you lose. You lost. Well, this year it's very important that we win because their redistricting is in line. So every 10 years we're able to redistrict. And it could be argued that redistricting the last decade really set up Republicans to lose because of the way the districts are gerrymandered. And I know if you look at our district, Kate, have you noticed that it's kind of the shape of a chicken? It's very odd shaped. Um, it's got fingers into Portland. It's, it's, it's gerrymandered in order to keep this district blue. And it works. I, first of all, I'm going to just, I, I've got to push back against you. The Senate has not been controlled by the Democrats for 30 years, period. Also, look, if you're going to talk about why you guys, why the Republicans walked out, you know, they walked out over a cap and trade where they were at the table. In fact, that cap and trade bill got over and over again. They were given things in order to make sure that the Republicans stayed in the building and they still left. They took, it took timber trucks coming down the streets of Salem when timber had been excluded out of that bill. So you were gonna, Republicans were gonna walk out no matter what was in that bill and the Democrats have been working with the Republicans. My question to you is, will you stay in the building and work, do the hard work of making legislation better or will you walk out with the Republicans when it gets too difficult? I 100% support what the senators did last year. And you know, if we have a quorum, <laughs> that is built into our state constitution for a reason and it is a legal recourse that we have to use. But you walked out on all sorts, okay. You walked out on all sorts of legislation. You walked out on legislation that would help with the wildfires. You walked and out on legislation that would they fund. Came back to they fund those bills. They came back and the Democrats did not show up. The Democrats walked out that yeah. last time. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. I have to say that after this, I don't feel that great about us uh, us in the state ever achieving like a uh, bipartisan consensus, but I think we're out of time. Uh, do, uh, Tess, do you wanna ask? Uh, I, we are out of time, but we do have to ask our fun question that we've been asking every candidate. Um, since we've been doing Zoom and video chat for the last seven plus months, what's the most embarrassing or awkward or funny moment you've had doing these video calls. Um, Harmony, we can start with you. Well, I have three little boys in the house and they're constantly running in and interrupting. So there have been several times when I have a, a little boy wanting to show me a Lego or tell me about his video game score while we're, while trying to work. So, you know, it, they're, they're a cute uh, welcome interruption sometimes. <laughs> Kate, same to yeah. us. Well, well, I, um, so I could think of that one time I had a, uh, I have a COVID puppy, like so many people, I got a puppy and I didn't tell uh, people that I was on this call with that I had a puppy and they, they, they knew I had a 16 year old son too. Well, I thought I'd hit mute and I was screaming at the puppy to stop peeing on the floor. And when I got back, like somebody asked me, is, is your son okay? And I'm like, no, 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 I have a puppy. No, no, I have a puppy. I was not yelling at him about peeing on the floor. So uh, that was, uh, you know, I had to confess because I didn't really want to tell people I got a COVID puppy like everybody else. Um, but yeah, that was pretty funny. Got it. Okay, well, thank you both so much for taking the time to talk thank with you. us. This is going to be out on Wednesday, the endorsement issue. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Thanks right. so much. Thank you. Alrighty, bye-bye.